in a few of our previous videos, we've talked about tinders that can be used for spark-based fire lighting, specifically with flint and steel. In this video, we want to talk about the actual ignition and the process of making flint and steel fires. The first part to that equation is the steel striker. The second part to that uh, equation is the stone. We'll be getting to these in each different part. Now, the striker has to be high carbon and high iron content and made of an exquisite temper if possible. Now you can get this from colonial style blacksmiths. Really fancy knife makers are making some really kick-ass ones these days. But we also have our own design called the Dragonfly Multi-Tool. You saw this in our cattail video where we used the fiber comb at the top to help process fibers for rope and for tinder. It also acts as a striker for flint and steel. Taking a piece of chert, you can see how well it works. The striker has to be of a high carbon content because that's usually got a higher iron content. And iron is pyrophoric. Bear with me on this, this needs some explaining. Pyrophoric is metals that are willing to oxidize at a high temperature. So when they are struck and have small pieces of them broken off and exposed to oxygen at a high rate of friction, they actually combust in the air. Now, with a ferro rod, the spark comes from the so-called flint, the ferro itself, the ferrocerium. In this situation, the flint does not produce the sparks. It's simply cutting the metal off of the striker to produce sparks from the striker. This is what's burning, not this. The way this works is you take a high silica content stone and your striker, holding them together and bringing them together at a high rate. If I scrape, all I'm doing is making small little filings of metal. That's it. It's not going at a high enough rate of friction and speed to cause it to oxidize at a high temperature. At the exact same spot, if I increase my speed, you see how willing it is to make sparks. That's all the secret is. Now we'll get into techniques later, but for now let's focus on the steel striker. Now. In some situations, people have talked about using the back of their knife. This is a Mora knife with a high carbon steel blade. It's brand new. And they speak about striking it to get sparks. I don't recommend that in that manner. We'll talk about how I prefer to do so later. Now the stone aspect of flint and steel needs to be of a high silica content or at least a hard enough stone to cut small pieces of iron from the striker. Now, does it have to be flint? Well, what's the definition of flint? You ask different people, geologists, archaeologists, etc., they have different opinions. Basically what's going on is you have a chalcedony or a high silica content stone that's being formed in either a chalk layer, which is flint, or in a limestone layer, which is chert. This is Keokuk chert. It's a little different than flint, but for our purposes, as you can see, it throws very good sparks. If I put down the Keokuk chert, and I pick up a piece of white quartz from the Bancroft area of Ontario. Keokuk chert, you don't find in Ontario. You can find Balsam Lake chert, Collingwood chert, and uh, Onondaga chert, and a few other stones in Ontario. But most of Ontario, especially up in the Canadian Shield, you find quartz. Quartz is another high silica content stone. It's not chalcedony in the sense of chert or flint or jasper. But as you can see, it still produces sparks. Very good sparks, in fact. And that's what I really want to explain here. The stones are not as important as the striker. If we lose the stone, we can find another stone. If we lose the striker, we're in a little bit of a harder situation. If I lose the stone, all I have to do is find a dry creek bed or even a wet creek bed or a lake shore or anywhere that's got exposed rocks. Then I take one of those rocks and I break it against another rock, crudely flint napping. And I take that shard and I test it with my striker. If it produces sparks, I keep it. If it doesn't, I throw it away and try another rock. Simple as that. Now, I gotta work a little closer to you guys so you can see what's going on here. But we have a piece of stone. This is uh, another piece of Keokuk chert. And I'm grasping it in my non-dominant hand and I'm bracing my wrist against my knee. The reason for this is I don't want this to move a lot. I want this to uh, stay fairly firm. 
and I want the edge pointing upwards as best as possible. I don't want it to have it perfectly vertical, but I want it more upwards than downwards. Make sense? Good. Now we're going to take the steel, whatever striker it may be, and bring it down, trying to almost miss with flicking of the wrist, keeping our wrist as loose as possible. You can see a shower of sparks being produced. That's all there is to it. That's it. There's no out here movement. It's all in here. That's it. You can work basically from your forearm down. That's how you make flint and steel. Now you can add your elbow and everything else if you really feel like you need to, but you're gonna lose a lot of your control that way. Keeping it in here is all that's needed. You just work inside this little area. Going to go in my little tinder box here. Just simply a tin with a whole bunch in the top to produce some char cloth. There's a lot of ways you can produce char cloth. You've seen one of our videos, I'm sure. Here's a good piece. I'm going to rip off a chunk. There's a lot of ways you can handle the char cloth. Uh, some people actually put the stone between knuckles like that and then hold the tinder up above. But I always feel like that's a little too far. But it can work. Just like that. For me though, the most effective way of holding this is holding the blade as I was earlier and simply grasping it with my thumb, clamping the char cloth just a little bit back from the blade or from the edge and simply flicking sparks at it. And there we go. That's all there is to it. Now that was the basic technique of using flint and steel. Another technique that is useful for when your hands are cold and wet and you don't want to be handling your tinder too much, especially if you have a tinder box like this, is to strike your sparks down to it by holding the steel in your non-dominant hand fairly firmly and striking flint onto it. And you can see that smoldering ember right there. Actually, there's a few smoldering embers. Woohoo! Nice and warm. Let's remove that one. Let's remove that one. Check for any more. Nope, we're pretty good. We can put that back inside the tinder box for later. That technique of holding the steel and using the stone to create the sparks is more useful when it comes down to that knife technique that a lot of people talk about. Again, this is a high carbon steel knife. It's got a good temper across the blade. It's not differentially heat treated too, too much to affect this. But a lot of people suggest striking down in this manner. Just like you would with a traditional flint and steel striker. Holding the blade with the tips of your fingers. There's a few issues with this that I have. First and foremost, there's a lot of danger. The biggest danger comes from the fact that this is most likely a last ditch effort situation. If I no longer have that, and I no longer have my book of matches or the ferrocerium rod on my knife, then I'm going down to last ditch effort of using this to do my spark making. If that's the situation I'm in, I am most likely going to be cold, under stress, and most likely wet from either rain, snow, or sweat. With that being said, grasping a knife with fine motor dexterity like that is not a safe idea at all. What I want to do is reverse that whole situation and immobilize the knife so I don't hurt myself. If I can find a block of wood, if you find a bench, you're pretty lucky in a survival situation. But if you can find a log, a fallen tree of any kind, put your tinder down, drive your knife firmly but not all the way into the log and strike down. Let's find a good piece of stone. There we go. That's a lot safer, don't you think? Now, to make my tinder nest or kindling nest, however you want to define it, 
I like to use white cedar bark. Now white cedar is Thuja occidentalis, also known as eastern white cedar. Uh, you can use juniper bark, which is also known as a cedar. You can use grasses, you can use poplar bark, you can use whatever fibrous dry material you have around. Um, some plant fibers are better than others, some do not work well at all. But what we're trying to do here is twist these fibers until they start to break and become ropey. And you can see that the fibers are starting to get exposed. If I bring those all together in one spot and start really cranking back and forth and buffing, You can see all this dust coming off. If you have the ability to catch it like I do here with this bench, good idea. If not, let it blow in the wind. It's not too, uh, too big of a deal. Again, rolling back and forth, buffing this between my hands until it becomes very fibrous. Now, this is really good for the main body of the bundle, but I like to put some finer stuff inside. The way we do that is using that fiber comb. Or, you know what, the edge of your knife can also work. But this is a little safer since you don't have an open blade. Simply scrape towards you. In a drawing motion. You start to get this really fine, almost like cotton, uh, cotton ball material. That is what we consider to be the best premium kindling or uh, coarse tinder to put inside of our nest. It takes a while to scrape it up like that, but you know, as the safest manner, I could take my knife, lay this out flat, and scrape, preferably with my hand up this way. scraping at a 90 degree angle, or I could even use the spine of my knife for the same results. What we're looking for is about a, oh, about the size of a ping pong ball of the really fine stuff, and a lot more of the coarse stuff. The fine stuff is just going to simply help the char cloth really burn hot. The less effective you are, the less experienced you are with flint and steel and putting a fire together like this, the larger your tinder bundle or kindling nest should be. Now, I've seen them the size of footballs, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The smallest I would go with, if you're really experienced with the size of a golf ball, and that's in really good weather and conditions, and you've got a lot of practice under your belt. In this situation, I'm fairly well experienced with my flint and steel. This should be enough for me to make a nest or make a fire, but let's make a very good one for a beginner. So I'm gonna take some more of this, twist this up. And again, begin to buff. And I'll see you in a couple minutes when the nest is done. So let's combine everything now. I have my char cloth here that I'm gonna lay up on top of a dry piece of wood so it doesn't get wet from the ground. I have my steel striker. I have my piece of flint, okay, a cup shirt. I have the small ping pong ball amount of fine kindling. And then a larger bundle, this is about the size of a, I'd say a small grapefruit. And I have it out a little flat. It's not curled up into a ball yet. I do that once I have the tinder inside. And I have coarser bark on the bottom that's not so important as the rest of the stuff so I can lay it down on some damp ground while I get the fire going. I have all this char cloth to work with, but I don't want to waste it. So I'm just going to break off a section that's about a one inch by one inch area. That's still a lot of char cloth for one fire. But you know what? It's good to practice with a large amount so you get a lot of heat. Again, I'm going to put it on top of the flint. I'm going to grasp it in my left hand, my non-dominant hand. I'm going to brace it with the edge pointing up towards the sky more than it is pointing towards the ground. I'm then going to take my steel striker and flicking 
I now have a glowing piece of tinder. I place it on top of the very fine stuff and then I start to coax it together gently without trying to smother it. There we go. It takes a little bit of coaxing to get it in there, but there it is. Now, here's a couple of tips for you. Try to find which way the wind is blowing. Face your back to it so that the wind is going to push the smoke away from you. And secondly, every time you take a breath, move the bundle away from you, and when you bring it back, hold it above your eyes, not at eye level or below. Less smoke and less chance of cinders getting into your mouth. So I'm going to turn my body this way. Now before I let this actually go all the way to uh, flame, you'll notice that it gets real thick green smoke just before it flames up. That's your indicator start blowing a little harder. I think I've made my point. I've got flames. Now if I wrap this with birch bark, I could have that start to go to flame. And if I just simply put this into a twig bundle, even better. That is from start to finish, basic flint and steel. If you're having trouble getting this blown to flame, it might be humidity in your mouth. It might be because you're tired, you're exhausted. It could be a lot of factors. Another technique is simply moving it back and forth. You can see how that worked. Now if you add a little bit of wrist movement to always face the embers towards the air you're pushing it into, it gets hotter. Pretty simple.